Hello and welcome to Doctor Who 50 Years Ago, the show that looks back to the episode that aired in 1970 and looks at the differences between then and now. I am Ben. I'm Luke. And I'm Nick. Here we are, three Doctor Who fans revitalising my dead podcast for a new series of Doctor Who 50 years ago. We're back because there's a new Doctor, new producer, and a new theme for the series as it transitioned from black and white into colour and into a new decade, the 1970s. Also, because ever since our current series ended, I've had a constant, and I mean constant, stream of likes from our Facebook page. Thanks very much. So here we are, ready to look at the differences between Doctor Who then and Doctor Who now, and the socio-political history of 1970 as opposed to 2020. It's season seven of the show, and big changes are occurring. So, throughout this series, we shall be subtly asking this question. Is Doctor Who heaven placed on Earth? Buckle up, because it's going to be a historical ride. So, here we are, and here we go into the news from 1969 and 1970. First, right on New Year's Eve, a chap named Marion Ngobi implements a Marxist system of government and creates the People's Republic of the Congo. Oh, politics. So it's quite interesting, this point about uh, the People's Republic of the Congo, uh, is showing that communism and Marxism is spreading in the world and this kind of relates back to the episode Spearhead from Space because this sort of episode you could think is a bit of a Cold War sort of paranoia about sort of uh, communist infiltrators. You could certainly view it from that sort of perspective so it's interesting that in the news just the week that this is coming out that you've got a reminder communism's on the march it's it's winning over countries more so than capitalism is at this point. I, and I would argue at this point, probably a lot of people were thinking that the Soviets were winning. I mean, they, the Americans were losing in Vietnam at this point. So it's probably the worst point for the Americans in the Cold yeah, War. Yeah, but when were they winning? Uh, uh, until the Tet Offensive, uh, the Vietnam wasn't going too badly for the Americans. But by this okay. point, it's already uh, a disaster for the Americans. The population mm. hates it now by this point. The Iraq War essentially was the last big war we've had, because in the last decade, war and the concept of armies and soldiering has scaled back quite a lot. On Thursday, the 1st of January, the National Environmental Policy Act was signed into law by President Nixon, which was the first comprehensive environmental protection legislation of the 1970s. Essentially, it created a presidential council, made all the federal agencies make environmental assessments and impact statements on all of their actions, which is very interesting from a man who was about to napalm quite a bit of East Asia. Uh, also, it's quite telling um, about how different it is now. Uh, this was a Republican president who created the Environmental Protection Agency and all these environmental protections. <laughs> quite a change nowadays. Uh, I don't think you'd see the Republican Party embracing that sort of policy. Hmm. So like, like the um, switch between the Democrats and the Republicans in the early 1900s, you could sort of argue we've had sort of the same this millennium. Certain, in certain uh, sense, yeah. On Saturday the 3rd of January, the Beatles recorded their last song, presumably somewhere near or maybe in the Abbey Road studios. Over to our media correspondent. Hello. So... Between the end of the Beatles and about 1973-1974, you get a massive drop-off in the quality of rock music. In 1969, you've got Steeler's Wheel, you've got Creedence, you've got the Beatles. In 1970, you start to get such an influx of easy listening style stuff. And until Slade and The Sweet come along, you don't really get anything to fill the void. And we see something similar in television as well. During the conservative years, 
we see more family oriented television. By the time you get to 75 and a bit onwards, everything gets a little more interesting, but everything is a bit cushier this time. Everything's a bit less punk than it had been. And I would sort of argue that that whole period of 1970 to 1974, um, well, the early years at least, would be would correspond with that sort of easy listening trend. And then you get to stuff like the three day week and the political insanity that was the two elections in 1974. And everybody just went, ah, screw it. We're just going to be insane now. And thus punk rock was born. Am I correct? Yeah. And we're all better for it in a strange sense. Yes, because we're still insane uh, 50 years on, in a way. Rather than season seven uh, representing a change from the 60s, you know, being a bit more colourful, whatever, to the more gritty 70s, would you agree with me, Luke, in saying that actually this is more of a throwback to the 50s then, this particular season, rather than a harbinger of what's to come? I mean, one of my points will make that sort of true, but that's up and coming. Uh, oh well don't want to spoil that then uh, uh, yes i basically agree cool (laughs) and finally on saturday the 3rd of january again a large meteorite entered the earth's atmosphere over oklahoma and the largest fragment recorded was 10.3 kilograms this as we're about to say is very story specific was this one also made of plastic on the very day that the episode broadcast. Mm. Mm. Couldn't make it up unless somebody made it up. It's a fake meteorite, lads. <laughs> yeah, someone wanted to make... Yeah, no, no, Robert Holmes, it, he, he did a little like, conspiracy with Oklahoma meteorologists or whatever. Yes, from the sixth floor of the BBC, he, <laughs> he gathered all his rejected scripts bundled it up into a giant ball and hurled it into space and it landed in Oklahoma. The amount of rejected Robert Holmes scripts. Yeah, I'd say you still had 10 kilos left after yes. burning up <laughs> most of what's come from the atmosphere. <laughs> that was the news. And now we shall get into Spearhead from Space, episode one, aired the 3rd of January, 1970, as we've discussed, written by Robert Holmes. But... For reasons I will explain eventually, it might as well have been aired in 1955. Luke and Nick, your thoughts on this episode? There are some aspects to this that I think can reflect the 70s. I'm thinking of some folk horror elements, okay? So you've got stuff like Witchfinder General, which came out in 1968, which is about a bunch of people out in the country finding some pagan past stuff and it makes everything very very bad and i kind of see what a lot of robert holmes stuff it's kind of in that same sort of area where there's something that's been found deep underground and it's gonna kill you all and so that's a very 70s thing however it is still a lot of people talking in rooms and that can happen anytime Yeah, I suppose it's down to the subject of the conversation. Looking at Robert Holmes's two other scripts, the first one being The Crotons, which was, it looks like, a very deliberate pastiche on the student rioting in the late 1960s. And we all know how well that turned out, both the student rioting and The Crotons. (laughs) One, um, capitalising on the space mania of the late 60s with the space pirates, and just how a little bit naff it might all have been. Again, we all know how that turned out. And now this, Spearhead from Space in 1970, which is, as you say, going to more folk horror tales. Yeah, but it is funny. You you get this this combination of this very sober 1950s style, you know, like B-movie sci-fi plot, you know, the radar station and then... uh, the doctor barely turns up so until then it's a very grounded opening but then you also as you say you get this farmer that spends so much time with him and he's such a almost caricature of a character and as you say he's very folky isn't it yes and sometimes it works to its benefits and sometimes to its detriment no i think it's a good opening because uh it really does it's a massive way of announcing this is different again it feels very realistic like you feel like this 
could be happening in the real world. There's some there's elements of the contemporary goings on, but also this plot does feel quite fifty throwback merged with contemporary folk horror, as you said, Luke. What an interesting mix of things. Let's talk about the episode a little bit further in detail. So, we begin with Technicolor Rectangles, a new face and a new logo. It's colour television, if you can afford it. Probably can't, so, but as you were, black and white. On Earth, some sweaty soldiers are watching a spearhead of flying meteorites coming to Earth from uh, space. A poacher is almost sniped by one, but he takes one before the army, or rather unit, United Nations Intelligence Task Force, can get their hands on it. So, the reason I talked about 1955 earlier is because the alien meteorites fall to Earth and cause havoc plotline is very inspired, if not completely stolen, from the second Quatermass serial, aptly named Quatermass 2. Insert photo of the novelization here. Written by sci-fi good egg Nigel Neal and transmitted in 1955. In fact, I think there's an apocryphal tale of Neal who wasn't best pleased at how British sci-fi transitioned from Crater Mass to Doctor Who from the 50s to 60s, ended up, um, ended up screaming at the television, having seen Spearhead from Space and how it blatantly borrows, or at least pastiches, Crater Mass 2. What other elements from Quatermass 2 can you find in Spearhead from Space? I mean, there's a giant factory in Quatermass 2 where they're making synthetic food, but in fact they're actually harbouring aliens, whereas here in Spearhead from Space they've taken over a plastics factory because they run on anything plastic. Yeah, the government's involved, the army involved in Spearhead from Space. No, I think it's interesting that it's taking parts from something which was transmitted 15 years earlier. Mm. I like that you've got this continuation of serial sci-fi. And even if something was, you know, it was only transmitted once, it's good that there was a cultural memory of it, at least in the mind of people in the know. I like that. The first colour shot of Doctor Who is of the Earth. Then we've got the radar and we've got formation. This is familiar Earth imagery. And I will be saying the words familiar Earth imagery until you hear it at night. That's what this whole thing's going to be playing on. And by the whole thing, I'm referring to unit, a drama, as I like to call the Pertwee years, because that's what it's trying more to do and trying more to play on. It's good to shake things up once in a while. Even if your show is go anywhere, do anything, it can still get stale and you can still run out of ideas. At which point you have to refresh it with a bit of, oh, I don't know, believability and reality. Absolutely. And that's what the Pertwee years sometimes did. So something else falls to earth, namely the TARDIS. And an older man than the one we're used to falls out unconscious. Smash cut to Dolly Bird number eight, Dr. Elizabeth Shaw, who's been snapped up from Cambridge to help UNIT, run by that man Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart, to help with the meteorites. Hurrah, continuity from season six, but it's not heavy continuity, allowing a potential new audience to step in with Liz. Well, that, that shot with Liz is a uh, very swinging 60s, isn't it? And what she's wearing, and yeah, she just uses more the 60s in this particular episode, not quite the, the 70s. final throws of Mary Quant and Emma Peel. Yeah, well, that outfit, she's wearing, like, plastic things on it, isn't she? Isn't that what it is? Yeah, I think... On that jacket, right? You know what I mean? So something nylon-y? I, I guess that that was the probably their intention thing. Hey, she's hip and young and down with it sort of thing, you know? That's what and a also 40-year-old a and also a scientist from Cambridge, yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting mix. Yeah. So in this bit, you've got the Brigadier Liz meeting. And there were two bits that jumped out at me. The first is that I started to drift off because it's two characters sitting down during an exposition scene. And I started wondering how much this new 
colour Doctor Who was actually using colour. And I got to the point of, this is very beige, and the TARDIS landed in a flowery garden. And then I lost interest because I couldn't think of anything else. However, the main interesting thing about this bit, the Brigadier says, in the last decade, we've been sending probes deeper and deeper into space. So this sentiment is echoed in 2005 by RTD in The Christmas Invasion, who, when he says, you're getting noticed, this planet's so noisy, I believe is the quote. I don't think anyone really believes that sending out Voyager, we're actually going to meet some aliens, at least not nowadays, definitely. And it's more playing on the fear of the dark, of the unknown of space, the fear of meddling. We, we'd only well, been into space the first time in 1957. Um, this is a bold, grand new frontier that, we, you know, scientists only know a bit about. And the, you know, hack sci-fi writers know even less about. So I, I, I think back then people probably did think, you know, this is very plausible that after 10 years of sending out probes and having radio signals and whatnot. I guess it's also something to do with the quote, we've drawn attention to ourselves. Whether that can be conveyed in a positive light, i.e. technological advancement, meaning we could actually send probes deeper and deeper into space, or in a negative environment, as we saw in the last story with the war games, the fact that we are the most warlike race ever, that aliens will take us for wars and things like that. An unconscious doctor is carted into hospital, and the TARDIS's presence is phoned into the brig, who comes running, expecting a cosmic hobo. Instead, he gets a long-shanked knave with a mighty nose, with two hearts and strange blood to boot. Thus is the third doctor, played by John Pertwee. Lab coat doctor man, not John Pertwee. He says to the brigadier, oh yes, this man's got two hearts, his... Um, he's basically an alien, his blood type's not like that of anyone on Earth. And the brig says, splendid, that does sound like the Doctor. Back then, continuity wasn't like what it was today. You can make up whatever you wanted on the fly. In fact, Robert Holmes, I believe, at least apocryphally, that he nixed that from a 1965 story he wrote for a film. So you could just bung anything in there. And in fact, once we get to the Deadly Assassin, he bungs more stuff in there, perhaps because he realised he can get away with it and it can be cool. So the porter uses the payphone to call the press. And he does this after overhearing lab coat doctor man calling them in the hallway. Now, I was trying to think about how this would play out nowadays. And what struck me is how easy this was to do and how easy it was to get away with it. And when we finally do find the press, the direction is, it's brilliant. You've got all of these television cameras bundling around the Brigadier, and there's a persistence of them, which I quite like shows the attitude of what people thought about journalists at the time and TV news in general. It's very, very intrusive, and... Uh, they get it wrong as well, because they say, I think he's got one of those meteors, and he's right, but he's not right for the right reasons. So is, I, is it the birth of sensationalist media as as possibly, well, immortalised by a certain Australian newspaper baron who got his way into Britain in the late 1960s? Ben, don't don't talk ill of him. He probably owns us. Yeah, that's that's that's, that's probably true. Yeah. Ugh. So some random unknown Welsh guy is a porter at this hospital. Just brings up the Daily Chronicle. Is that a national newspaper or a local newspaper? Who knows? And uh, he says, "Hey, there's something weird going on here." And then apparently the nation's media descends on this hospital. So I, I think it does suggest when it came to like things about space, people were more more willing to believe in extraterrestrials and strange phenomena back then. One final bit on the media point, uh, drawing comparisons between 50 years ago and now, we see one vast rumour and the entire media comes running, 
you can also build up a giant rumour on social media as um, prophesied in 2015's The Zygon Invasion and The Zygon Inversion and boom, explosion on social media and then the public just forget about it. So not much has changed. I, I guess what's different is is the medium and also what sort of things people could believe. You know, I mean, fake news is a big thing now. And this this sort of thing shows that people always have been able to have their heads turned by silly narratives or fake news or whatever. But uh, it's more just the way it's delivered now is different. And you wouldn't get the national media or people on social media talking about aliens in this sense. Not something about, you know, what I mean, mm. it shows that we've become more cynical in certain ways, but we also haven't actually gotten any better in some ways as well. <laughs> In that press pack, there's a creepy man in a suit lurking in the hospital with the press, curious about things occurring in the vicinity. Meanwhile, the poacher steals a glowy, flashy meteorite and dodges unit patrols who are less than curious about him, whilst the doctor attempts to escape back to the TARDIS after his recovery in the hospital. This, however, is hindered when he is kidnapped by the man in the suit and his sweaty-looking cronies. So first of all, Dr. Coatman... He shows very little regard for the cleaner. This is just before the cleaner rings up. And it's like, so he's upper class and the lower class Welsh guy has to know his place. So upon hearing something, the the, 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 the cleaner guy, he calls people. So it's like, he's really like, oh, will he give me money? As in, so it's like, he's untrustworthy and is money grabbing. Hmm. Well, possibly well, because he's not paid well. Yeah, but still, all right. So he's looking for a quick, quick profit. But also it's like, he's immediately willing to like, uh, you know, tell on his bosses. Hmm. Okay. And then also the um the farmer guy, he's willing to, again, he will only be willing to hand over the orb if uh if the army will pay him money. Hmm. Again. Also, he steals the orb. So again, working class people are being depicted as untrustworthy and stealing, like wanting money grabbing, or you're trying to get a quick, make a quick penny sort of thing. You know, 2005. The hero is the working class girl. The doctor suddenly has a work, like a northern accent, which people would associate more with like a working class accent. So it's like, it's interesting how you know, nowadays it'd be more likely that it would be the doctor or someone in a higher, like Dr. Labcoat man, I mean, uh, or someone in our position of authority would be the one depicted doing shady stuff than, you know, people down the bottom. And finally, there's action. The doctor escapes from his kidnap attempt in a wheelchair and tries to get to the TARDIS. But unit patrols are in the way, and in their infinite wisdom, they shoot the Doctor. And very prevalent in this series, and indeed in the John Pertwee years, is the military mind. And how trigger-happy they are. Man with regional accent shoots the Doctor, and the very last words are, You stupid person, why'd you do that? I think that just slams the regional accented in this story even more. Robert Holmes feels like... The, the upper class are, are rubbish and the lower classes are rubbish and the middle class is all right. <laughs> what I liked about this bit as well is that the people who grab the doctor are dressed as doctors. So this is something that we'll see in Terror of the Autons. People dress as authority figures, being able to marshal people around without too much opposition. And there's also that, that, that communist fear of the person next to you can overthrow your capitalist ways. Absolutely. But, Especially since Robert Holmes was a policeman. As you say, so you've got the authority marching you around, but also people in, at this point are, are much more willing to defer to authority than I think now is the case. For this first part, it is indeed a very good opener, if there is a little bit talky bit, but you soon get to the action, and so therefore it is visually arresting. I, I was disappointed by the lack of the utilization of the new color you know i i feel that well on one hand i feel that they could have done something more interesting now that they had this new toy to play with but at the same time doctor who was made on a budget of about 13 pence there was all the cameramen went on strike and it was uh slapped together by people who were told you basically have to film here yeah, well, I think because it's all shot on location, I think it's more a reflection of fashions and what buildings looked like at the time. That everything is beige. Yeah, it's that it's that contrast of late sixties and 
vague manic ability to get the show done. So what we've got here in Spearhead from Space Episode 1 is a vibrant mix of colourfulness of location filming versus dull talking sequences, though with occasional bits of action. And then we've also got realism in the form of meteorites coming to Earth and communist takeovers of other people and media bits and pieces. Then we've also got the strange science fantasy of a man with two hearts coming from space to save us all. And let's face it, the both madness and realism, colour and vibrancy and complete dullism can be seen both in Doctor Who 50 years ago and now and the world 50 years ago and now. That's the whole point of this podcast because we're also very vibrant and very dull. Thank you very much for listening. You can find us on Blogspot, which redirects to iTunes. Leave positive comments there, it helps. You can also find us on Facebook and YouTube, where you can like, comment and subscribe. And Google+, Plus, if it's still a thing, and I don't know. We shall be back next week with episode two of Spearhead from Space. Until then, I have been Ben. I have been Luke. And I have been Nick. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you.